chicks in bikinis. Oh yeah, hey, hey, there's a primer thing. Primus is one of the most unlikely success stories in music. To put it mildly, their music is, let's just say, extremely weird. Somewhere between Tool, Frank Zappa, and the soundtrack to some bizarre imaginary circus with lyrics about fishing and Willy Wonka. And yet somehow, this incredibly strange band has managed to hit the Billboard Top 10 two times, sell two platinum albums, and become a fixture on MTV with music that sounds like this. They also created the theme song for South Park, as all of you know, is one of the longest running, most popular comedy TV shows of all time. Oh, and did I mention that their guitarist arguably invented death metal? It's true. And they're still going today, selling out three to 5,000 seat venues every time they tour. And the question is, how do they do it? What is the story behind one of the most unlikely successes in music? And also, I'd like to thank Factor for sponsoring this video. They deliver chef prepared meals that are delivered straight to your door that are ready to eat in just two minutes. It's the perfect solution if you're looking for fast, upscale food options done easily. That means you can skip the trip to the grocery store and all the chopping and the prep and the cleanup and all that while still getting the flavor and nutrition that you need. And it's also a great way to save money. They've done the math and Factor is cheaper than takeout or even worse, getting delivery, not to mention way healthier. And they also have a ton of options. Personally, I like Calorie Smart, which is under 550 calories per serving, but they also have lots of other options like keto, vegan and veggie, and tons more. Personally, I love that I don't have to think about what to make for lunch. I just go pick something out of the fridge, and I know that it's going to taste good, but I'm still going to hit my macro goals, which is very important to me. So if you want to check out Factor, and honestly, I think you should, head to factor75.com or click the link below and use the code PUNK50 to get 50% off your first Factor box plus free wellness shots for life. That's two free wellness shots from three available flavors for every order while you're an active subscriber. I first heard Primus on the MTV show Headbangers Ball, I think in like 1991, but their origins go back way further than that. The band started out in 1984 in the Bay Area with the original lineup consisting of Les Claypool on bass, Todd Huth on guitar, and a drum machine because they just couldn't find anybody to play drums. And after eventually finding a human being to play drums, in 1986, they recorded their first demo, which features early versions of some of their classic songs like Sergeant Baker. It's definitely a little bit slower and looser than what they would turn into just a few years later, but even then you can hear the potential. As one sign that they were onto something and that people recognized what amazing musicians they were, one day Les Claypool even got the call to replace Cliff Burton in Metallica. Lars you're not used to playing this kind of music, are you? And I was like, no, hey, you know, you guys want to jam on some Isley Brothers tunes, you know, and uh, nobody, nobody laughed at my joke. The Metallica gig obviously didn't happen, but that might have been a good thing because after going through something like half a dozen different members over the course of a couple years, Primus's lineup finally solidified with Tim Herb Alexander on drums and Larry Lalonde on guitar, who had also played with Les in a metal band called Blind Illusion. And with their lineup finally somewhat stable, they recorded their 1998 demo, Sausage. <laughs> This was by far the best sounding thing they had done so far, and it became a hit in the Bay Area metal scene to the point where it looked like this weird little band might actually go somewhere. And so to take advantage of the momentum that they had, they borrowed $3,000 from Les's dad to record their first album. It was called Suck On This, and they made the somewhat strange decision to do it as a live album. Typically, a live album is something that bands only do when they're well into their career as kind of a bonus to the fans. It's generally not the way you would want to introduce your band to the world. And yet something about it worked, probably because the band was so insanely tight that their live recordings sound better than most bands do in the studio. And as Les Claypool remembers, Suck On This was their first real breakthrough. We pressed a thousand records and took them around to the stores ourselves, and we set aside like 200 records to send out to radio stations around the country, college radio stations. And it sold out like right away locally. We were like selling out at the Omni at that point. 
Then the college radio picked up on it somehow, and it just caught on, and we made another thousand records and sold those. The traction they got in the underground with their independently released album got them signed with Caroline Records, who would put out some very important punk and metal bands like Suicidal Tendencies and Bad Brains, and they finally released their debut studio album in 1990 called Frizzle Fry, featuring the lead single, John the Fisherman. When I go up Les Claypool ranked this as his favorite Primus album, and personally, I agree. It's still weird as hell because, I mean, it's Primus, and I don't think they could be normal if they tried, but the songs are a little bit more accessible than their other material, and it became somewhat of an unexpected underground hit, selling something like 80,000 albums and catching the attention of major labels who were looking for the next big thing. And it might sound insane that major labels thought Primus of all bands could be that next big thing and were courting them in sort of like a bidding war, but it did actually kind of make sense at the time. Remember that this is when Faith No More broke out with Epic, Red Hot Chili Peppers were blowing up, and funk metal was probably the biggest new trend in the world of heavy music. And so they eventually signed to Interscope Records as the second band on the label, but Interscope would eventually go on to be the home of artists like Limp Bizkit, Lady Gaga, and Eminem. And it was co-founded by the legendary Jimmy Iovine, who you may know as the co-founder of Beats. So they had some serious firepower behind them. And so they released their second album, Sailing the Seas of Cheese, in 1991, which would change everything for them. But right now we've got the guys from Primus. They have got the new album, Sailing the Seas of Cheese. And you've got a video called Jerry Was a Race Car Driver. Thanks to having the power of Interscope behind them, they were able to get a lot of support from MTV, especially on their weekly metal show called Headbangers Ball, who turned their first single, Jerry Was a Race Car Driver, into something of a hit. It got to number 23 on the Billboard charts. The album sold several hundred thousand copies in the first few months. And somehow, one of the absolute weirdest bands on the planet had become kind of a mainstream success. And let's talk a little bit about why all of this happened. First of all, this was the 90s, and so basically, in the wake of Nirvana's success, anything alternative was cool. But let's also give Primus some credit where it's due. They did something incredibly rare and hard to do, which is that they made these fun, catchy songs that had kind of cross over mainstream rock appeal, but were also incredibly weird and technical, and they're maybe the most progressive band to ever have that level of success. And the first thing that anybody noticed, even if you didn't necessarily know that much about playing music, was Les Claypool. Even if you had never picked up a bass in your life, it was obvious that this man just completely redefined what was possible to do on bass. He played a fretless six-string bass with a whammy bar, which to this day, I still don't think I've ever seen anyone else play, and he was doing stuff that seemed, frankly, just impossible for a human being to play, such as the main riff from Tommy the Cat. And so you had this very interesting thing where bass was the lead instrument in the band, and Larry's guitars were an equally strange perversion of what anyone would expect from a rock guitarist. With so much going on with the bass and Tim's drums being so technical, there really isn't a lot of room for the guitar to do typical guitar things. And so he almost didn't really play riffs per se. It's kind of more just like ambient sounds. <laughs> And I understand that a lot of that sound came from their original guitarist, Todd, but I think Larry really took what he did and built it to another level. And to compliment both of them, Tim Alexander is just an absolute monster of a drummer. Kind of like the alternative Terry Bozio, I would say. And so as unlikely as it was, at the same time, you can also see why it worked. And they continued to ride the wave, making a small appearance in Bill and Ted's Bogus Journey with Keanu Reeves. And somehow they even played MTV's Spring Break special in 1992, right after Mark Wahlberg, at the time better known as Marky Mark. But that was just the beginning for Primus. And if that's all they did, it would still be very impressive, but that was just the beginning for Primus. In 1993, they came back with their next album, Pork Soda, which was even more dark and odd than Sailing the Seas of Cheese, with the lead single, My Name is Mud. And once again, somehow they got a lot of support from MTV, especially the hugely popular show Beavis and Butthead, which gave them a lot of love. No, there aren't any chicks in bikini. Oh yeah, hey, hey that's a primer thing. <laughs> 
And thanks to all that, somehow this album managed to hit number seven on Billboard. The legendary critic Roger Christgau called them quite possibly the strangest top 10 band ever. And personally, I am inclined to agree with him on that. They also played Woodstock 94 for the 25th anniversary of the iconic festival, where just like everyone else, they got pelted with mud. Very appropriate for a band with a song called My Name Is Mud. And just to prove that all the success wasn't some kind of strange cosmic fluke, they came back with their fourth album called Tales From The Punch Bowl in 1995, which once again felt like it was almost deliberately designed not to be successful with its bizarre cover art, and the lead single being a song called Winona's Big Brown Beaver, which was was about exactly what you think it's about and had an incredibly strange video of the band wearing these just like nightmare fuel plastic cowboy costumes. The song title got them in some hot water with MTV, who thought that the lyrics were a little bit too suggestive for prime time and so the video was relegated to only being played at late night, but somehow none of that mattered. Primus was just like an unstoppable force at this point. The album hit number eight on Billboard, making it their second album in a row to hit the Billboard Top 10, and somehow they even got a Grammy nomination for Best Hard Rock Performance. Larry Lalonde summed all of this up well in an interview he gave at the time. Before every new record, I swear, this is the one nobody's ever gonna get. No one will possibly understand this one. No one will ever buy this one. But I've been proven wrong every time. But despite all of their success, Primus was struggling behind the scenes. In 1996, their longtime drummer Tim Herb Alexander left the band and was replaced by Brian Mantia aka Brain who had actually been in the band before for like two weeks and he was one of the very very few people that could possibly fill Herb's shoes. And just a quick side note if you've never checked out his instructional video you absolutely should. I remember getting it when it came out and to this day it's basically like the bible of Groove to me. And with Brain on board, they got back to work, stumbling onto what would become yet another huge moment for the band. Two guys in Colorado named Trey Parker and Matt Stone were working on a new animated show for Comedy Central called South Park. And when it came time to do a theme song for their show, they reached out to Primus. But as Les Claypool tells it, the band did not take this very seriously. We had watched their Christmas thing that was going around and we realized that these guys were pretty clever, but there was no way in hell that they were going to be able to get something like that on television. And so Primus quickly banged out a song and sent it to the show. But after Comedy Central came back and said that the song was too slow for the opening, with the band being busy on tour, they were ready to just walk away from the project. As South Park's co-creator Matt Stone described it, we couldn't get their management to talk to us. They were like, fuck you, dude, take the song. And so eventually the South Park guys just sped up the song, convinced Les Claypool to redo the vocals while the band was on the road and someone just held a portable tape recorder up to him. And that became the South Park theme song that's probably been listened to more times than anything else the band ever did. And they followed that up with the Brown album in 1998, which was more of kind of a fuzzy lo-fi take on their sound. In Anti-Pop in 1999, which started to kind of venture into new metal. Anti-pop was an interesting experiment, bringing in honestly a pretty cool variety of musicians as guest producers, including Tom Waits, Fred Durst of Limp Bizkit, Tom Morello of Rage Against the Machine, Stuart Copeland from The Police, and even Matt Stone from South Park. It also had features from James Hetfield of Metallica and Jim from Faith No More. And although critics at the time generally liked the Brown album and Anti-Pop, Les Claypool ranks these as two of Primus' worst albums, and personally, I kind of agree with him. As he explained, at the time, the band was basically just running on fumes. It was a tough time for the band, personally. We weren't getting along very well. And that ultimately led the band to take what would end up being a very extended break. We went on a hiatus, which is a fancy way of saying we just didn't like being around each other and we wanted to break up, but we didn't have the balls to actually break up. I think we stopped before we totally shit our pants, but I think the closest we came to doing that was the anti-pop record. But after a few years, the itch to play together sort of came back. And so they reunited with Herb in 2003 for an EP and a tour, and they remained somewhat active Active throughout the 2000s, but they didn't release any other new music, partly because Herb was kind of losing interest in the band and ultimately quit for a second time. He was replaced by another one of their early drummers named Jay Lane, and in 2011, they released their first new album in over a decade called Green Nagahide, which to me kind of picks up where the Brown album left off. Yes, nicely,
which was followed by the return of Herb for the second time, and probably Primus's single Strangest Project, an album covering the entire soundtrack to the movie Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory. And in 2017, they released what is, as of now, their final studio album, The Desaturating Seven, which is a concept album based on the 1978 children's book called The Rainbow Goblins, and takes their sound more in the direction of prog rock like King Crimson. Personally, I think it's their weakest material, but even then, it's certainly not bad. It's just not really what I want from Primus. But at the same time, I also understand that a band can't stay the same 30 years into their career, and I always support bands that make the choice to experiment. Which brings us to the last question. What is Primus's lasting impact and influence? First of all, to this day, I still don't think there's anybody on the planet that can do what Les Claypool does on bass. I think he has just like fundamentally transcended humanity as far as his skills on that instrument. And that's especially impressive given that these days there's tons and tons of just random 16 year olds on TikTok who can play drums and guitar better than I would have ever imagined possible back in the 90s. But at least to me, I still don't think anybody has topped what Les Claypool can do on bass. They also created the theme song to one of the most iconic TV shows of all time. Like you can't really think of the show South Park without immediately singing that melody in your head. And there's probably millions and millions of people who know them just from that. But beyond that, unless there's something I'm missing, I think they still hold the title of the weirdest band to ever have the level of mainstream success that they've achieved. I mean, back in the 90s, who could have ever imagined that the band that wrote Jerry Was a Race Car Driver and Tommy the Cat would play MTV's Spring Break special, hit the Billboard Top 10 twice, and sell well over 5 million albums. I certainly didn't, and I don't think anybody else did either. And as for the future, well, I think Les had the perfect answer for it in an interview from a couple years ago. People would ask, back in the old days, how long is Primus going to go? And I would say, well, it's going to go until it's not fun anymore. All right, my friends, that does it for this video. As always, let me know what you think in the comments. Also, I would like to thank everyone who supports me on Patreon. Patrons get all my videos and podcasts early. There are members only channels on my Discord that I'm super active in. I do giveaways, I do Q and A's, and there's even a way to have me review your music. So if any of that sounds cool, hit the link in the description of this video. And with that, I'm going to sign off for now, but I will see you next time.